now. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to, um, to meet with you this afternoon and to kind of go over uh, information about uh, life after your university studies. We're joined here today by Carol Armstrong with Armstrong Law. Uh, Carol has worked with the University of Alabama uh, for many years now. Uh, she uh, and her firm represent the University of Alabama for our green card processing uh, for faculty and staff here at the university. And, uh, and so she's been a great colleague uh, and presents quite often in our uh, professional conferences. And uh, I'm very glad she's here with us. I also have joined with us uh, a few of the staff. So uh, Nadine Carl is on the uh, call. You may uh, know her. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself and say hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the student advisor here at IEEES. So I've probably met quite a few of you, particularly if you're going through the OBT processing. Um, I'm helping for this. So if anybody is looking into it and wants information, just make sure you come and meet with me. Uh, I'll answer every possible questions about OBT. Thank you, Nadine. And then we've also got Rosanna Yolian. I don't know if uh, you are able to unmute yourself and say hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosanna Yolian. I'm a CVS coordinator. I just started a few months ago as a CVS coordinator. So if you have any questions about your I-20s extension or uh, any I-20 questions, please get in touch with me. Thank you, Rosanna. Well, with that, uh, I we can get things started. So, Carol, uh, would uh, would you like to introduce yourself, and <laughs> and we can get get going here? That sounds great. Uh, I'm Carol Armstrong, and it's my pleasure to be here with everyone this afternoon. I uh, hope that we're able today to provide you with some helpful information and help you start planning for, as Charter said, life after the University of Alabama and what what you, steps you need to take to ensure your continued lawful presence and work authorization in the U.S. Um, once you have graduated. Um, we're going to go through kind of from where you are now to what is next with OPT and then some other options for other types of temporary status as well as some permanent residency options for you. Uh, as Charter said, if you have questions as we're going through the presentation, just drop those in the chat box and we will get to those um, as applicable. And so welcome to the presentation, welcome to the workshop. So the very first thing um, that I want us to talk about is OPT. And I'm going to defer to Charter and his team and allow them to talk to you about the internal processes and timeframes and that sort of thing uh, relating to OPT. But I want to point out one big theme, and it's one that's going to run throughout this entire workshop. Plan ahead. Don't wait until the last minute because you may lose an opportunity that is available to you. Get in early, ask questions, put a note on your calendar, put a reminder on your calendar, whatever it is you need to do to make sure that you don't miss deadlines, uh, because those um, can, you know, missing deadlines can mean that you just don't get the benefit. Charter? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's a, a huge, huge point uh, throughout your your journey with immigration. I, I've always laughed at like it, in my younger mind, I thought six months was forever and three years was even more of forever. And now, uh, I mean, you blink and, and five, six years have already uh, passed by. So it planning early uh, for each of your steps is, is important. Uh, and with OPT, uh, that is that is true as well. One thing I was going to do, and I know we've got the this first slide up here, but I was going to drop uh, um, kind of a link, and I'll I'll add I'll bring this over here so everybody can see it. But we do have a page, and it's it's kind of designed for specifically planning for your last semester. Uh, now, on this uh, chat and on this webinar, we might have a few scholars or faculty. Uh, so if you're on here, some of this is applicable to you as well, but uh, but I can share with you later uh, some slides and some information from our prior session with our international faculty and researchers. 
but in this page, we have a final semester checklist and it really kind of goes over those last things, the things that you need to be aware of in your very last semester. And it talks about specifically enrollment requirements, but then about employment on campus and then about OPT or, or academic training and about your grace period. So if I come down here to the employment section, it just really stresses that OPT is a one year work authorization uh, that you can get within your field of study. It is possible that you might get a two year extension on that if you're in a STEM eligible field, uh, but you have to submit uh, your application uh, with USCIS early, up to 90 days before graduation and no later than 60 days after graduation. If we miss that window, it is forever gone until you do another degree. There is no, you know, my bad, I'm sorry, we didn't meet these requirements. These are hard set requirements and USCIS will refuse any application that is outside of this. For day one students, your, your window of time is a little narrower. Uh, you only have a 30 day grace period after you complete your studies. And that is after, uh, typically after the commencement date in the semester in which you complete your studies. Uh, and be aware that your on-campus employment ends when that I-20 or the DS-2019 ends. So you want to be thinking about this early. Um, and uh, Nadine, you're, you're here. Could you touch on what you're seeing as like the normal processing times for OPT applications? Uh, processing time right now, I would say about three to four months from, so that's from the time the student actually submits the I-765 to USCIS. And when we actually receive the EAD card, the student cannot start working until they've received the EAD card and the start date listed on the EAD card. So like I have students filing right now for OBT um, and they are requesting start dates very early January. And to be honest, it's it's gonna be very tight for them to get it by early January. My guess is they'll get it sometime in January, but early January, I kind of doubt it. Um, also, I want to stress out that for um, graduate students, PhD students, uh, master students with thesis, your final semester is not necessarily the semester you graduate. Your final semester is when you submit your thesis or your dissertation to ProQuest. So we shorten your I-20 to the end of that semester and your whole OPT application timeline is based on your program end date. Yeah. For those of you who are looking, uh, so again, I, we have all this information on our final semester checklist uh, page. But if you go into the current student section of our website, you'll have a lot of things on here, but enrollment requirements and exceptions are there and the final semester checklist are there. Under the enrollment requirements and sections, we have a whole part on graduate end dates. Uh, now on here, it, it details for doctoral and master's students. And the vast majority of people who signed up today are either on a doctoral or master's program, uh, but just be aware that like the timing of everything is really about the submission time for your dissertation or your thesis. If you submit it, uh, you know, like at the early part, so let's say for fall 2023, if you had submitted it before August 8th and did not have to enroll in any hours this semester, technically we consider your I-20 and your F-1 status to have ended back in August. For those who will be submitting their dissertation or thesis in December, uh, and trying to beat this December 19th date uh, so that you don't have to register any hours at all in the spring semester, be aware your I-20 ends on December 16th. That's, that's the end of the fall semester because you will have submitted it within the deadlines of submission in the fall semester. We consider you complete in the fall semester. So everything, like Nadine said, is tied to your final semester. Uh, so take a look at that. If you have any doubts, any questions, please talk with us. We uh, obviously we explain this over and over again, and it's a very complicated thing, uh, but we are happy to uh, clarify that so that you can make your plans accordingly. Um, the last thing that I was going to share, and uh, of course, this bar is blocking my ability to, <laughs> to get to it. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, 
trying to drag this out of place. Here we go. Student employment. If you look here, this is going to get into some of the next segments, uh, but we have a whole section on student employment, which includes OPT, and uh, there's a segment even on uh, the uh, life after um, academic training or, or your practical training. So uh, do take a look at that. And with that, I'm going to move this back over here. Did we cover all the questions, Carol, or uh, do we hit on anything or forget to hit on anything? I think you covered it pretty uh, pretty well. I think the one thing that if I were uh, a student getting close to graduation that I might want to ask you is how much is this going to cost? And, and you know, if I have a job and they want me to start, you know, the November the 15th. Um, so is there a way for me to get it quicker than three to four months? Yes, and we didn't touch on that, but one of the big, big changes that has occur occurred in the last year, there well, two big changes, really. Um, the uh, I-765, uh, which is still a paper form, uh, they have rolled out an electronic filing for certain categories, which includes OPT. So you can file electronically and ostensibly that means it will go faster. You'll get an immediate receipt notice. You'll get an immediate case number, which is brilliant. You don't have to wait a week or two. We'll still get the physical copy mailed to us, but uh, but generally speaking, you're going to get that uh, immediately uh, when you file electronically. If that the normal application for uh, OPT, I believe, is four hundred sixty dollars. Uh, Nadine, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm probably wrong. Four hundred and ten. Four hundred ten. I don't know which form I'm thinking of right now that's $460, $410 for the I-765, but for the low price of $1,750, I believe. No, nope. uh, $1,500. $1,500, okay. There's, yes. there are I mean, I can states. imagine this is going to increase really soon, but yeah. we're still at $1,500. We're still at 1500 So there are three different types of premium processing fees, uh, but premium processing can be done for I-765s. So for $1,500, uh, you can expedite your uh, case with USCIS. And instead of three to four months, you're looking at around one month uh, processing time. Now, they don't give the same two-week premium processing timeline that H-1Bs get, but they it does significantly improve the time frame for getting your card. So if you did have a job offer and it was in November and you were graduating early and submitted your thesis or your dissertation early, you could pursue that option. Uh, that's something that you would want to talk about with uh, with Nadine before you file. Uh, but it is definitely something that you could pursue. And we've had several students file premium processing, right? Nadine, have you seen pretty good success with that? Uh, yes, we've had several, particularly over the summer, because we had students who were graduating at the end of the summer and were looking to get jobs um, on in colleges where they had to start in August. So waiting three, four months was not an option for them. And they, it all went pretty fast. So what USCIS um, guarantees, it's a guarantee that they will approve or deny your case within 30 days. So afterwards they still have to, mail, to produce and mail the card to the student. Um, so it could take up to, there's no guarantee on how long it's going to take for the card to be delivered. Uh, what I've seen, the experience I've had, is that within a month, the students were approved and had received their cards. Um, but once again, USCIS guarantees that your case will be adjudicated within 30 days. Then you still have to get your card, and there is no guarantee on how long that will take. So I have a question, Charter and Nadine. So if I get this this OPT card, um, and now I'm in, I guess, OPT status, and so do I just travel with my OPT card? While well, you're still in F1 status, so you have to travel with a valid um, I-20. You need a valid visa when you re-enter the U.S. And to facilitate things, you need to take your EAD card with you 
as well as a job offer letter. Uh, the job offer letter should show should basically show your financial uh, situation and show that you are financially stable. Uh, but if you have pay slips that you can bring with you, it doesn't hurt. And that's really about all you need once you're on OPT and you're traveling. What if what if my OPT card is going to expire on um, the end of? December and I want to travel back home over the holidays and plan to come back in about December the 25th. Is, am I going to have any problems? As long as your OPT, as your EAD card is valid, you're fine. But past the end date of your EAD card, then you're not going, going to be able to re-enter. Unless you file for a STEM extension, if you are eligible for the STEM extension or Possibly you filed for another status, but if your F1 status and your OPT is all you have, you won't be able to orient after the end of your EAD card. I will say, though, if you're also re-entering that close to the end of your uh, OPT period, you're, be ready for some questions when you come through the port of entry. There, it's not to say that they will deny it, but they might look at it and, and they can... They can figure it out. It's like, you've only got about one week left of your status. You know, are you really coming back to resume that work? And what are your plans when this work ends? Um, so they, they may ask some more specific questions. Um, and, and it could be that you're waiting until you get back on U.S. soil to then file the H-1B with your employer or something like that. So who knows? Yeah, I think that that's a good point on the travel because it, the closer you get to that expiration date, the more likely you're going to get hit with secondary inspection. Uh, so I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that. What about uh, let's say I get my EAD in the middle of January, Nadine, and I still don't have a job, and I mean I'm going to be unemployed for a while. So how does that impact it? Okay. So once you are on OPT, so once you've received your card, uh, let's say the start date for your AD card is January 15th. Um, during your one year of OPT, you are authorized to not work for 90 days. So you can build up to 90 days of unemployment, but as soon as you get past those 90 days, you lose your F1 status. So these 90 days can be used at any time during the one year of OPT. So you could use like one month at the beginning, then work full time for a couple of months and be unemployed again for a little bit. But as soon as you accumulate up to 90 days, you're losing your F1 status. Is that, does that rule apply for my STEM extension? It's similar for the STEM extension. So for the STEM extension, if you combine your employment, your unemployment during your OPT and your STEM extension period, so over the three years, you cannot go over 150 days of unemployment. So during your STEM, it really depends on how much you've already used during your initial OPT. We actually have a question in the uh, chat. Uh, somebody asked, is OPT guaranteed for students, uh, especially for PhD students? There's never any guarantees because that goes through USCIS. USCIS is issuing the um, work authorization. Um, but I mean, most of the time in probably 99% of cases, our OPT um, applications are approved. Generally speaking, OPT practical training is a benefit of your F1 status. So assuming you've maintained status, and assuming you've submitted everything on time, that you included the proper filing fees, and you included all the documents requested, and you responded to any requests for evidence, they should approve your case. Uh, so it, they, it's, it's more about timing and uh, submission of proper documents more than anything else. But they can, uh, and, and Nadine has seen this with request for evidence, they can ask lots of questions. They can say, hey, we want proof that you were enrolled properly in this PhD program and you were maintaining your F1 status. So they could ask for transcripts or they could ask for syllabi from your courses that were listed in your transcripts. They may ask for uh, all sorts of things. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. It's actually quite rare, but you know, it, 
it's within their purview to look at anything to make sure that they know that you are maintaining status throughout your program. Uh, and sometimes if you are a PhD student here, but you were doing your master's or your undergraduate at another university, they may even ask about your history with that institution uh, as an F1 student. So they may look further back than just your time as an F1 here. Uh, so, uh, you know, just be aware of that, not to scare anybody or anything like that, but these are the types of things that we deal with on the employment visa side too, uh, because we are asked again in the H-1B world and often in the green card world to, um, to clarify, you know, prior status. So, um, and there is a, another question that came through in the chat. Uh, does anyone have to have an employment offer before being able to apply for OPT? Nadine, would you like to answer that? Oh, you're muted. I'm I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Actually, the chat is not showing right for me. Oh, this one was a direct message. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so does anyone uh, need to have an employment offer before applying for OPT? No. So when you file for the initial OPT, you don't need to have a job offer at this time. When you file for the extension, you will need to have a job offer when you're filing for the STEM extension. Okay. And then going back to that, how long could you go without employment? You could go up to 90 days as soon as your EAD start date kicks in. Okay. And then what happens if for some reason you reach 90 days and you never found a job? My advice is to exit the US unless you've started some other type of process. Um, you always have the possibility before the end of your 90 days to transfer to another school or be admitted in another program and get an, a new I-20 for this, but that will have to be done before your 90 days end. Now, I will say to everybody on the uh, on on the program today or on this uh, Zoom, it, you know, the OPT section, it's long. It, there's a lot of information in it. There's a lot of uh, links back to handouts and things like that, but it's pretty thorough. So reading through that will help you better understand and and uh, arm yourself with questions to then, you know, make an appointment with Nadine and uh and uh and and discuss those more thoroughly. Uh so uh, please do take a look at that. Carol, you think we're ready to move on to the next part of our jungle? <laughs> I think so. So we we have our OPT and you know we we found a job and maybe you're maybe you qualify to get a STEM extension, maybe you don't. So you have to think, start thinking ahead. Okay, so what's next? Because your OPT won't last forever. So the next section I'm going to talk about are employment-based temporary status. In other words, you want to uh, fit into one of the temporary categories in order to be able to continue to work and remain in the United States. So the very first most common, um, most common temporary status that is sought is the H-1B. And so the H-1B status gives you lawful status in the United States as well as work authorization for the employer who petitions for you. The H-1B is employer specific, it is job specific, and it is location specific. And if any of those things change, then the you'll either have, if it's a change of employer, the new employer will have to file a new petition for you. If it's just a change in your location or your job, you may just have to amend the existing H-1B. But those are all matters um, you know, about to just let you know, this is not like the OPT card. The OPT card, you can work for anyone. With the H-1B, it is very specific on who you can work for. So on the next slide, let's talk about H-1Bs. First of all, H-1B, to qualify for that, the it has to be a qualifying occupation, and these are commonly called a specialty occupation. And what that means is the job itself requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a particular field of study. So for example, a particular fields of study, accounting, civil engineering, um, psychology, you know, social work. In order to be an accountant, 
you need an accounting degree. You need that specialized field of study. You can't go get an English degree and then become a CPA. That doesn't work. So you want to make sure that the job itself is one that's going to qualify as a specialty occupation and that you have the degree that is required for that occupation. There are, there are annual caps. In other words, each year, and that year starts October the 1st. So for, uh, for October the 1st through September 30, that's the fiscal year of the government. And so that is the cap year. Typically in early March, prior to the October one day, employers will go out and they'll they submit registrations to USCIS, that's the Immigration Service. And then by the end of March, typically, USCIS, USCIS conducts a random selection. It's called a lottery, H-1B lottery, because it literally is the USCIS agency going in and running a, you know, a random selection process of the applications that have been submitted, uh, the registrations that have been submitted by the employers. The the issue with that is because there is a limit, and that limit is 65,000 uh, new H-1Bs each year, plus an additional 20,000 H-1B numbers for folks who have a U.S. master's degree. So that is very important um, to, to understand that there is a limit. And so what happens and what has happened almost every year since this um, 65,000 plus 20,000 cap was placed, the USCIS is getting about three to four times as many registrations as there are numbers available. So you got a one in three or a one in four shot um, of actually getting selected to then submit an H-1B petition. So that is very, very important to know ahead of time. So you... You need to know, are you going to work for a CAP exempt employer or a CAP subject employer? If it is a CAP subject, then that employer, when it submits that registration, if you're not selected in the, in the lottery, then you won't qualify to get an H-1B for that employer. There are some employers who aren't subject to the, these CAPs. And those employers do not have to, I mean, they can file an H-1B at any time of the year. If they're your cap-exempt employers, Charter, do you happen to know off the top of your head a, a cap-exempt employer? I know a couple. <laughs> uh, universities, colleges, and, yeah, colleges and universities are broadly speaking cap-exempt, meaning we can file an H-1B at any time. And it's not just the public universities, that includes private institutions, community colleges, uh, four-year colleges, uh, doctoral institutions. We are all higher education institutions. Uh, even your for-profit institutions like University of Phoenix is considered a, uh, a higher education institution. Working for those institutions uh, falls under the cap-exempt categories for H-1B filing purposes, meaning they are not subject to this annual restriction on numbers, nor are they uh, subject to like certain times of the year for filing, they can file at any time. Um, so yes, uh, if you are in a doctoral program or in a master's program and you were ever thinking about teaching classroom instruction or even working in research or anything like that, uh, university work is great work. I've been working for universities for the better part of 24 years now, uh, or 20, no, 23 years. Uh, so it is well worth your time, uh, but you have that added benefit of you have a potential employer sponsor there. And that's, that's very important to think about. Um, do we have anybody from career services on the call today? I don't think we got a chance to invite any of the folks from over there. I, I think I invited them to the uh, other session we did uh, yesterday, but not to this session specifically. Okay. Well, I, what I would encourage you to do as, as graduating students is to be sure to sit down and, and have a, have a session with your career services officers, because they're going to have uh, some 
insight into which of these cap subject employers are for national friendly. You've got some employers that simply will not agree to sponsor uh, for national for an H-1B, period. They're just not going to do it. And then there are some that are extremely friendly and happy to, you know, to, to sponsor you for an H-1B and maybe even permanent residency. So you, you really want to have some conversations with career services and make sure that you're looking in the right direction. Like, you know, like Charter said, if you're interested in, in working in academia, then you don't have to worry about these caps. But if you are working for a cap subject employer, you have to plan ahead. For example, remember we talked about, um, you know, let's say you're a May graduate and you get your OPT, let's call it July 1st, and you start working and you're working for a company who is subject to the cap. And you're only going to have that OPT until June 30 of the following year. So February of that following year, your employer needs to be seeking an immigration attorney's advice. And that's the absolute latest because they're going to need to submit that H-1B registration first week of March. And they will know typically by the end of March whether or not you have been selected to then submit an H-1B petition. There are also, um, there are also, can be, you know, a, an additional round of selection, if you will. And I've had that, that's happened in, you know, the last couple of years, there's been another round of selection somewhere in, you know, July, August. And that's basically the first round of select selections have until the end of June to file the H-1B petitions. So if some of the ones selected don't file or they are denied for some reason, then those numbers go back into the pool, if you will, and there will be another round of selection run. Let me ask you this, though, Charter or, or Nadine, either one. So if I if I get selected and I'm going to file my H-1B petition, but Carol said that I, the start date's not until October 1. So, but my OPT is going to run out uh, June 30th. So do I have to leave the United States and quit my job? And I can answer. Well, no, let me let Nadine answer because <laughs> she deals with it a lot more often than I do. Um, so there's something called cap gap, which will basically um, maintain your F1 status and your OBT until your H1B kicks in. So you will have to That's keep reporting to USCIS um, as you would during, as you had to during your real official OBT period. So for those of you who are in STEM fields, you're going to have, you know, additional opportunities, if you will, to to try to, you know, to register and try to be selected for the cap subject H-1B number. So if you don't get, if you your employer registers the first year, you don't get it, then register. You can register each of the next years. Uh, there is no limit on the number of times that you can register uh, you can't have multiple companies register for you, but you can, you know, have repeated registrations while you are in OPT. Uh, and I've had lots of clients that have, have had to do that, and some got lucky within the three-year period, and some of them didn't. Um, so it, it, you know, the odds are not that great. Uh, they're better than Vegas odds, I'm sure, but they're they're not that great. So either you are selected. If you're working for a cap, cap subject employer, and if you're not, when your OPT runs out, unless there are some other options out there, or you, you know, are able to start another, you know, another degree level, then you are probably going to have to leave the United States. Um, keep in mind, like we said, these are employer and job specific and location specific. Uh, once you keep you, you have a maximum of six years that you can be in H-1B status. And so they'll give you a three-year period, plus a, then you can extend for, for the second three-year period. And then you're done. You have to leave the United States for a year, and then you can come back and apply for a new H-1B. Unless 
The exception to that rule is if you have started your permanent residency processing and there are some specific timelines for that, then you may be able to extend your H-1B well beyond the six-year limit if you're caught up in some of the backlogs uh, for some countries in particular uh, permanent residency categories. And we're going to talk about that shortly. Do we have any uh, questions in there for H-1Bs, Charter? If not, I'll move on to the other temporary options. No, no questions on H-1B at the moment, no. Okay. So on the next slide is the list of some other temporary options that could be available to you. One in particular um, that I think can be helpful, if you are from Mexico or Canada, you may qualify for a TN. And as long as you have a professional position, you can apply for that, and that will allow you to live and work in the United States. If you have um, exceptional ability and an area of expertise or your skill set, then you can apply for what's called an O visa. If you are working uh, for a company who has made uh, or is engaged in making substantial trade with the United States and it is on, let's just call it Germany, and the company is owned by a German and you are German, then you may have the be eligible for an EVs, a treaty trader or a treaty investor. Um, one, another one that's not listed here is an E3. If you are from Australia, you can qualify for the E3. The E3 is basically the H1B, a special H1B for Australians is what it boils down to. You have to go basically through the same process, um, but it's just a special program that is only available to you if you are an Australian citizen. The next slide, there are some special types of uh, visas that are available for athletes. It's called a P visa. There are the L visa. That's going to be for intracompany transferees. If you're working for a company who has locations inside the United States and another country, and you go to work for that company outside of the U.S. at its um operations abroad for at least one year in the last, you know, within the three, last three year period, then the company can then bring you here to the U.S. on an L. If you're working in uh, either a managerial or executive role, if you're not, or if you have what is considered specialized knowledge relating just to that company. The, um, the Bs are for just visitors. That's not really going to get you any employment authorization at all. And then there's a special type of status for victims of certain qualifying criminal activity. Uh, if you have been a victim of a crime and you have reported and cooperated in the investigation or prosecution, it may be worth talking to an immigration attorney to see if that qualifies for the U, because with the U, you get lawful status, work authorization, and you can apply for permanent residency at a later period in time based on being that, being that victim of qualifying criminal activity. So there are a lot of temporary options. And, but I mean, each, each category has its own specific requirements. So you either qualify for it or you don't. But you can at least um, get in, be informed about the options that are there and have that knowledge when you're when you're going into the workforce or, or applying for a job to be able to discuss it with the employer to see if this is something that they're willing to sponsor you for. Again, the, it's really important um, as far as knowing when to talk to the to the company about this. If you're trying to, if you're going to work on an OPT and you've got one year and it's a job that's going to qualify for an H-1B and that's, um, <laughs> and, and that employer is subject to the cap, you're going to have to have that discussion with them early on. Uh, if they are a larger company, they may understand exactly what they need to do and already have somebody working on it in there. If they've got an HR department or immigration department, but if if you're going to work for a smaller company who's never hired a foreign national before or never had one that they wanted to keep for a longer period of time, 
you, you're going to have to get them educated a bit. And a lot of times what I tell um, the Ford National employee to do is, hey, let's set up a meeting with your employer. Obviously, I'll you know talk to them and explain to them what's involved and answer any questions that they may have. And that is usually helpful. So that's something to, th to, to be aware of and to think about. So we've talked about all these different temporary options, but at some point, all of these run out. H-1Bs will run out, the L's will run out, the E's can run out, although they're not as likely to. Uh, so what what next? I mean, I, obviously I've got to figure out what I'm going to do when my H-1B runs out. And I'm going to be proactive, like Carol said, and I'm going to make sure that I'm planning ahead. And so I'm going to you know, start having that conversation with my employer about sponsoring me for permanent residency. Keep in mind that if you go through permanent residency, you are going to have to maintain your underlying non-immigrant status during the, during the course of that permanent residency process. And the reason for that is all employment-based permanent residency requires you to have maintained status in order to be able to complete um, your adjustment of status to permanent resident. So just beware of that. Also, I always get the question, well, how long is it going to take? And I give the standard lawyer answer that everybody hates is it depends because it does depend on a number of factors. And we're going to talk about what some of those are. Next slide. So one of the most common um, paths to permanent residency is labor certification. And labor certification is um, U.S. law that requires a test of the labor market by a U.S. company to see if any U.S. workers, which would be U.S. citizens or U.S. lawful permanent residents, who uh, qualify for the job and are willing to take the job. And it's intended to protect, protect U.S. jobs for U.S. workers. That in and of itself, if you if your employer can go through the steps required for labor certification and is able to show the Department of Labor that there's not a qualified U.S. worker available to take this position, um, then you can the employer can use that recruitment as a basis for labor certification, which is the first step in certain of the employment-based permanent residency categories. So there are there are basically three categories within the employment-based preference system for, for permanent residency processing. You have employment-based one, EB1, that's the first preference. There are much fewer people who are gonna qualify that and we'll talk about some of the options there. Then you've got employment-based second preference, EB2. EB2 is gonna be for positions that require a master's degree or higher. And those, Typically, the EB-2 has a pretty significant demand on it. EB-3 is employment-based third preference, and those are going to be for your professionals and your skilled workers. That absolutely, you know, if the job does not require a master's degree or its equivalent, then you're going to fall within the EB-3 category. So once we know which, uh, you know, the position and what it requires, then we can figure out which of those categories you will be applying in. This is important because the immigrant visa numbers are allocated by category and then by country. So if you're waiting around, um, if, if, if your country has greater demand in a category like EB2, then you're, there, there's going to be a backlog and it's going to take longer to get through your process all the way. So traditional recruitment uh, can be if we're going through the basic recruitment or traditional recruitment for labor certification, that requires the employer to go out and basically place ads and try to find qualified applicants for the position. If that search does not come up with a quali minimally qualified U.S. worker who's willing to take the position at the salary offered, then the employer can move forward with labor certification. If not, the employer cannot move forward with labor certification. Now, we talked about universities getting some good breaks on the H-1Bs because they, you know, they don't have to worry about that cap. Universities also get a pretty good deal in the labor certification called special processing. 
it's only available for teaching positions, but it basically allows the university not to have to go out and test the labor market again because they are able to use the recruitment that they've already conducted in actually making the hire. So that's a, another benefit that universities have. If you go through permanent residency and I'm, I'm sorry, if you go through labor certification and the Department of Labor approves that labor certification, the next step is filing an I-140 petition for alien workers. That is filed by your employer and the employer basically, you know, attests that they've offered this position to you. It's been certified by the U.S. Department of Labor and, you know, they're they can afford to pay you what they've offered and you qualify for the position. Depending on the immigrant visa availability for your category and your country, then you may also be able to file what's called an I-485 application to adjust status. I will tell you that for EB-2 and EB-3 categories, there are backlogs for India and China. And actually, there are backlogs for India and China in first, second, and third preference categories at this, at this point. Um, but the, the backlog for EB-2 and EB-3 is substantial. So even if you get through labor certification and you get an approved I-140 petition, none of that gives you um, lawful status or employment authorization. It is only when you are eligible to file your I-485 application and get it approved that you are a permanent resident with the related work authorization. So be prepared if you, particularly if you're from one of those countries that you're gonna, you know, you may be able to get through the first couple of steps of your process, but you're not gonna be able to complete it, sometimes for several years. So Charter, that brings to mind a question. So if, if I'm from India and this thing may take me 10, 12 years to get to the end and actually get my green card, do I have to go home after the six years? Uh, no, thank goodness. Uh, and it, it's one of those things where um, Homeland Security has realized its own problem. Uh, and so they built in solutions. Uh, there were times in my career where they didn't have solutions to uh, very obvious problems like, you know, something like this, where you're going to run out of your six year limit of H-1B. And uh, if you're in a backlog category that can't be approved uh, earlier than that. So basically, if you have a uh, green card case that has been uh, has a priority date uh, that is at least uh, before the start of your sixth year. So basically, if you filed something with the Department of Labor or with USCIS and it has a priority date that uh, falls before the beginning of the sixth year, or if you have an approved I-140, and you're in one of those black uh, backlog categories, um, then uh, you are able to have your employer continue to extend your H-1B beyond the normal six-year limit uh, in something called a seventh-year extension. Uh, and we have had uh, a number of employees that have had to go into extensions well beyond the uh, initial six years while we wait on final adjudication uh, and the availability of the green card for um, their green card category. So uh, that's that's pretty, uh, it's uh, hopefully pretty reassuring uh, to, to everybody here that you could remain, but it's all about that timing. I know Carol stressed on that at the beginning. Timing is critical. Having a case that's pending early that will allow you to do these extensions beyond six years. Everybody here, six years, I, I mean, I just handed off uh, my second H-1B approval for somebody who has not begun her green card yet. And I'm like, in the back of my head thinking like, we're going to be at the end of that second, you know, H-1B really fast. So we need to talk about, you know, making sure to timely file these things and, and get those things going um, sooner rather than later. And keep in mind, anything involving labor certification in the EB-2 or the EB-3 category is employer sponsored. So the employer decides whether or not it will sponsor you for labor certification. Um, there, there is some responsibility of the employer to pay for portions of the permanent residency case as well. Um, for labor certification, the cost of recruitment, attorney's fees, the employer has to pay that. They're required by law to pay that. However, um, 
you are not, the employer is not required to pay anything else. They're not required to pay the cost of the I-140 petition or your I-485 application to adjust status. Em an employer may choose to do that or may choose to, you know, split the cost with you in some fashion, but they are not required by law to do that. They are required by law to pay the cost of labor certification. And just to, on that same note, on the H-1B processing, keep in mind the employer is required by law to pay the cost of the H-1B process. So they are required to, if there are attorney fees, they got to pay them and the filing fees, they've got to pay those as well. They cannot, an employer cannot make you pay those fees. They cannot, you know, deduct, deduct it from your pay. They, they just cannot do that. It's illegal. And if an employer is trying to do that, um, you probably are going to have a situation where you're going to have to have a discussion with them because if they do so, it could cause your H-1B to get revoked. So you definitely don't want to be in that situation. Uh, so just keep in mind about the, the payment of the cost. So let's go on and talk about some other types of permanent residency processing that don't involve this labor certification. There is a category, and it's also in EB2, uh, second preference category, and it's called the National Interest Waiver. This is a category that doesn't require an employer sponsorship. You may self-petition for this. Uh, a lot of people who don't are not in a position, a job that is considered to be permanent, or if they don't qualify for some of the other outstanding EB1 level categories, this may be your only option. And the EB2 part of it just means uh, you have to show that it's in your, your work, your proposed work is in the national interest. And so much so that the, the requirement for labor certification is waived by the U.S. government. So this particular category uh, is of particular benefit for what type of university employee, Charter? Uh, postdocs, which many of our doctoral students will probably begin their career as a postdoc. And, uh, and so uh, their, their employer may not be able to ne necessarily sponsor them for permanent residency because a postdoc is not a permanent position with the university. And so they may be restricted on being able to move forward with anything through the employer directly. So if you're going to petition in the national interest waiver category, you've got to show that your proposed endeavor, your work has both substantial merit and is of national importance. You've got, and what that essentially means is, uh, for example, if you're in a STEM field, there's a presumption under the, um, the Biden administration's STEM initiatives policies that allow you to have a presumption that if you are working in a STEM field, that that is presumed to be of national importance because of the STEM initiatives. Um, you also have to show that you're well positioned to advance this proposed endeavor. And we're going to talk about how you prove that. And then the last item, you got to show that it would be beneficial to the U.S. to waive the requirement of a job offer and labor certification. So, for example, maybe it wouldn't be, you know, it wouldn't make sense to go through labor certification. If you've got a unique knowledge or unique um, work in a field that you have worked on, and it may be that it's in the, it's, it's beneficial to the U S to waive that labor certification, because even if your employer were to go out and conduct recruitment and test the labor market, even if they found a candidate, they're still not going to have you because it's your contributions that are of significance. Or if there's a situation where there's some sort of, um, you know, time is of the essence, some urgency of your work that needs to needs to move forward uh, very quickly. Next slide. So how do I prove uh, that I qualify for a national interest waiver? Um, you got to look at the national importance. We talked about the STEM field, but if you're not a STEM field, you know, what is that potential perspective impact of your work? And you, you got to demonstrate that and how it is uh, important to the United States at large. You've also got to show that it's got substantial merit. Um, if you, you know, if, if you're going, if you're getting any sort of research funding, 
uh, grants. That is helpful to show substantial merit. If you've got um, your work is going to result in, you know, employing U.S. workers, that's one way to show substantial merit. You also have to show that you're well positioned to advance this proposed endeavor. You know, look at what what have you accomplished in your field? What are your plans for future progress? Uh, or is there any interest from the outside? Are there, you know, national or international agencies that are willing to fund your work or have requested you to, you know, speak to them about your work? Uh, have you given have you given any um, conference presentations? Do you, what is your publication record? Is there, we talked about interest by your governmental agencies, you know, your, your, your work, the citations to your work, others discussing your work. What is, you know, all of those things are important to show uh, that your position to continue to advance this, this work um, is in the balancing test is, you know, what is this, what is this, what are you bringing to the U.S. that is important enough that, we don't have to go through the labor certification process. And we talked about that. Is it urgency? Is a job offer just impract impractical to go through that process? Showing leadership in the field is another positive factor. Um, so anytime you can show if you uh, have, you know, served uh, on a, you know, on a committee uh, or that you have, you know, chaired something at a conference or you have been on a planning committee for a conference, things like that can, can be really important to show. Next slide. Does anybody have any questions before we go on about the national interest waiver? I want to stress that labor certification processing is objective. There are certain things that you have to do. You have to do them within a certain period of time, but if you can click off all those boxes, you will get approved. Not so with the national interest waiver. It is a highly subjective category as well as some of the other e the EB1 categories. And you know, you you don't want to file this unless you think you've got a pretty good case because they they scrutinize these very carefully. The good news about the national interest waivers that uh, is recent is that now you can actually premium process a national waiver petition. What that means is you basically pay, pay an extra $2,500 to the government for them to uh, get you a response on your petition within 15 days. That has not been the case previously. And, um, you know, a lot of people were filing these and it was taking a year to two years to get to get a response back on whether or not they were approved for the national interest waiver. So it, it's really important, like I said, thinking about timing. If you need, you know, if you need to get a decision on that so you can go ahead and apply to adjust your status to permanent resident, then you, you may want to spend the additional money to get that decision more quickly. I do want to point out, remember how we talked about the backlogs uh, in EB2? for India and China and the backlogs for EB2 and the EB1 categories. EB2 is a lot worse backlog for India and China than EB1, okay? So although there's a, a slight waiting period, if you will, backlog in EB1 for India and China, it's really bad uh, in EB2. And particularly for India, I mean, you may be waiting to file that last step in your permanent residency. You may be waiting a decade or longer. And Carol, we did have an NIW question. Someone asked, could someone apply for an NIW while they're still doing their master's degree uh, if they've completed a certain number of credits? Your education is one factor that USCIS is going to look at in determining are you well advanced to, you know, to uh, well positioned to advance your endeavor. That may be difficult if you don't have a doctorate. I, I have a, a case on my desk right now with a guy who is, he has a master's degree, but he does not have a doctor's. Uh, I think he has a decent case, but that one in particular is, you know, you have to overcome that idea in the officer's head. Well, you're not, a, you don't even have a PhD. So how are you going to, you know, how are you going to advance this? So it, education is a factor. I would say if you don't have at least a master's, Unless, you know, you've discovered a cure for cancer or, you know, something major like that, I would say wait 
uh, until you've built a little bit more. Uh, and and I, I would say the same. And I'm assuming with that question, too, that they have not completed the master's yet, which one of the EB2 thresholds is they you have to have an advanced degree, something yeah. beyond a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, whereas and, and the credit question is interesting because here at the university, they won't let you teach, do classroom teaching until you have. I believe nine credit hours of graduate level coursework in the discipline uh, to be able to teach in the classroom. So uh, because we typically require masters to teach, but if you're going to be a graduate teaching assistant, uh, they allow you to do it with a, a certain number of credit hours. Uh, and there uh, was another question, can this be applied for a J-1 visa uh, for a national interest waiver? Um, and I know we talked about this with the two-year home residency requirements uh, in the in the last session. Uh, you know, uh, technically, yes. Uh, in fact, we will have J-1 applicants, uh, but the transition and maintaining visa status uh, until the time that you can adjust status is important. And if you are subject to the two-year home residency requirement, you may not be able to get to the end of your green card uh, application because one of the two-year home residency requirements main restrictions if you have a J-1 visa or if you were previously on a J-1 visa is you cannot um, you cannot adjust status to permanent resident. So uh, it, it's one of those things that does become complicated. Being on a J-1 does not mean you automatically were subject to the 212E. Uh, it, it, there's three criteria that will trigger that. But uh, at the same time, it does get complicated. And I would say prior to doing any filing, it's worth talking to an attorney or to your J-1 advisor uh, in order to get a better feel for what your 212E situation is and, and maybe what kind of things would potentially complicate uh, going forward. Um, so, yeah. And that's a, that's a good question and a good response. Daughter, the key here to remember about those um, to your home residency requirements is you can't change status unless you're changing, you know, to F status and you cannot adjust status to become a permanent resident until you either serve the two years or you obtain a J-1 waiver. And again, that's a little outside of what we're getting into, but I do want to point that out that like Charter said, if you are subject to that and you are, you know, hoping to stay in the United States and change status and ultimately become a permanent resident, you need to understand the implications uh, of, of filing for the J-1 waiver. How could that impact your travel? Uh, that sort of thing, because that's that can be tricky sometimes. Yeah. And so um, there was one more NIW question. Uh, and that is, uh, can you apply for the NIW if your master's degree uh, that you hold currently is from another country uh, and you're pursuing, you're pursuing a PhD in the U.S. currently? Yes. Short yeah. answer. The short, yeah. You probably will have to get a degree equivalency so that you can show yeah. master's equals master's. Um, we see that a lot with our H-1B filings where we have to show a, a doctorate earned abroad is the equivalent of a U.S. doctorate. Um, but at the same time, I, I also wouldn't see an issue with that. Uh, for the other question on the national or uh, the two-year home residency requirement, uh, I will uh, touch on that later. Uh, I would say, uh, again, for 212E questions, you're probably going to have to make an appointment to see what to see us. But generally speaking, home country residence requirement means you must live in your home country to fulfill it. It can't be done in a third country. Uh, it, you, all you're doing by living in a third country is postponing the inevitable. Um, having, and I will say this because it, it, I, I, it's my personal story to share. My wife was on a J-1 when we met. Uh, and it was a government funded J-1 uh, through the U.S. government. So that's unwaivable. Uh, the U.S. government does not like waiving its own funded programs. And so she and I lived in her home country for two years after we got married uh, in order to fulfill that requirement. Um, and and it, they count the days. They literally count the days. I will say that. So we went in armed with documentation of all days spent in the home country. And we, we accounted for the brief 
a uh, couple of weeks that we went to a neighboring country for a business trip and the three weeks we went somewhere else for a vacation because those were not spent in the home country. We we counted down to the day uh, in order to show that we had fulfilled the 212E. Um, and they've actually just yesterday released new guidance to clarify how to count those days, uh, which is actually a, uh, makes it a lot cleaner, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, two-year home residency requirement if you don't get it waived, it must be fulfilled in the home country after you finish your J-1. Uh, moving on, uh, let's see here. Carol, do you want to continue with uh, the other categories of self-filing? Yes, yes. So um, with we've gone through EB-2 category, EB-3 category. We've talked about labor certification. We've talked about getting a waiver of the labor certification through the national interest waiver. So let's talk about a couple of the EB-1 categories. And the first one is outstanding professor or researcher. This one is not self-petition. In other words, um, your, your employer would be required to file this petition on your behalf. Um, the basic requirements are you have to have at least three years experience in, a teaching, in teaching or research in the academic area. Um, the teaching has to be full teaching responsibility. So a teaching assistant experience is not gonna count. The research typically experience, we want to see that um, being gained post PhD. And that's just because there, there are some additional hurdles that we have if we're trying to count research experience that you uh, gained prior to getting your degree. And you must be in a either a tenure or tenure track teaching position or a comparable research position. Um, so this is for someone that, you know, probably straight, straight out of a doctoral program, you're probably not going to qualify for this. Uh, very few will there, you know, it may be that you've done some things that could, you know, previously that could qualify you for it, but usually you're going to have to be a few years out in the field before you're going to qualify for this category. But if you are working in one of those types, types of positions and you have the experience, um, the, on the next slide, we'll talk about the criteria that you must meet in order to qualify as an outstanding professor or researcher. So there are six criteria that are available for you to meet. Uh, and the Immigration Service says that these are the criteria that they're going to look at to determine whether you have demonstrated that you've made international impact in your field. Um, let me get that next slide, Charter. Okay, so you've got to prove that you uh, have been recognized in at least two, by meeting at least two of these criteria. Um, what I generally recommend is let's try to get, see that we've got three because that's going to give you a much stronger case. Um, receipt of major prizes and awards, membership in an association which requires outstanding achievement. That's going to usually be an invited membership. Uh, published material in professional publications that's written by other people about your work. Um, evidence that you have participated as a judge of the work of others. Maybe you're reviewing journals, reviewing articles for journals. Maybe you are on a PhD dissertation committee. Maybe you have reviewed, um, reviewed uh, submissions, grant submissions for NSF. Maybe, you know, those are the kinds of things that they're looking for there. Uh, authorship of your own publication record is important, and then other evidence of original scientific research. Do you have a patent? Do you have a software license uh, or licensed software? I'm sorry. Do, have you presented at conferences? Those are just one, a few of the ways to prove the criteria there. And I'll point out that you don't want to submit a case that has weak evidence in any of these categories. For example, receive a major prize or award. You don't want to submit, you know, best teacher for the fall of 2023 award. That that's not that's considered very weak and it's not it doesn't meet the criteria. And so USCIS will actually use weak evidence against the case. And they don't just simply ignore it. They will say, well, you know, you you have this. And so clearly you don't have, you know, a major prize or award because all you have is this. There for the outstanding professor and researcher category, I do want to point out um, that this is an EB1. 
the EB1 category is current for most countries other than India and China. There is right now a, a, a backlog for India and China, but it is not nearly as bad as EB2. So it may be that, you know, when you start out with your permanent residency process, if you've got an employer sponsorship, it may be that you start out with the labor certification case in an EB2. And then maybe once you've been in the field for a little bit, it may be that you would then qualify in one of the EB1 categories uh, as outstanding professor or researcher or extraordinary ability. I'm not going to get into the other EB1 category, which is uh, extraordinary ability, because that is that is probably the highest level of the category and the most difficult to prove that you are, uh, you know, of extraordinary ability because you have to show sustained national or, or international acclaim in your field. That takes time, um, unless you've got some major prize like a Nobel Prize or something like that. But you, it takes time to build up that sustained acclaim. A lot of the, um, a lot of the criteria are similar in an extraordinary ability case. In an extraordinary ability case, in addition to what's listed here, uh, you also, if you can show that you commanded a high salary, if you can show that you are in a have been or are in a leading or critical role for an organization um, that you know is of paramount importance, um, so or have you know distinguished reputations, so that particular category, although there are some folks who can meet it, um, you know, whilst you know fresh out of their doctoral program, those are few and far between. We have any other questions about the permanent residency processing, and then I'll talk briefly about other types of um, other types of categories other than just employment based. We did have a question about time counted towards the three year experience, whether or not time as a postdoc would count towards that three years. Yes. Basically, anything after your completion of your studies is is yes something that you can count for professional experience. So, uh, all right, so we can move on to the next slide. Here we go. And so there are basically three paths to temporary status and permanent residence in the United States. One of those is the employment-based processing, which we've gone through. Um, there's also a protection group of category, or a protection category. That's going to be your temporary protected status. That's going to be your viable petitions. That's going to be your crime victim cases. And that's going to be your asylum and refugee cases. If you are from a country that um, is, you know, you have a fear of returning to that home country because of, you know, some change in the country conditions, you might want to speak with an attorney, an immigration attorney about the possibility of applying for asylum. Because asylum does give you a firm path to permanent residency. Um, so does the viable, which is basically uh, a, you've been abused by a U.S. citizen spouse or a permanent resident spouse, or you're the child of a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident who has been abused. Those cases, you know, if you either fit into those or you don't. Uh, and asylum claims are really difficult in the United States. And so you got to be able to demonstrate that your your fear of return is a credible fear based on country conditions and your past and um, future persecution that you might face if you return. Finally, the last uh, main category or path to permanent residency is going to be through family relationships. If you find love in the jungle and that love interest happens to be a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident, you may have an option to go through family-based processing that doesn't take nearly as long as all this employment-based um, processing as, I mean, it's just much quicker, usually much quicker, and it, you know, it's just a clean case in most situations. Yeah, obviously, it has to be a bona fide marital relationship, and if any of you are already married and he or she is not a U.S. citizen, then, you know, obviously this won't apply to you. Um, but there are some other family-based categories 
Uh, and we, we could look at those if you have family members in the U.S. who are either permanent residents or U.S. citizens, there may be some options there. It's typically not going to be uncles or cousins or anything like that or grandparents. It's going to be, you know, parent relationships, child relationships or sibling relationships. And like the employment based preference categories, these family based preference categories, you know, also have backlogs in many countries. Last slide, I want to tie this up by reminding you, plan ahead. Um, don't wait too long. Make sure you're considering if you have spouse or child dependents, how does this impact them? Um, you know, we talked about, for example, in failing to plan for your children, for example, uh, if you're from India and you're in a backlog, you know, that's 10, 12 years before you can get to the finish line and your child turns 21, that child's not going to be able to adjust status with you and is going to lose that H4 status that, that he held. So you just need to really think about, like I say, planning ahead, don't wait too late. And also keep in mind uh, travel issues. Travel out of the United States can be impacted through, you know, filing for permanent residency. The good news is with H-1Bs and H-4s, you can continue to, you know, to travel with those without a problem. However, on the other temporary categories, not so much. And so you've really got to understand, okay, if I start this process, at what point in that process am I going to have a problem if I travel? And so that's where you get, you make sure you get good advice from your immigration attorney about whether or not you can travel during, you know, certain stages of your permanent residency processing. Um, period. That's all I have. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. So I think we've got most of them. There was one that I said that I would get to later and I uh, let it slip by. Uh, and, and it wasn't really one of the main ones because it is it is a lottery. Somebody asked about the diversity visa lottery, and they specifically said, hey, if I apply for the diversity visa lottery, does that have any impact on my F1 status? Uh, you know, am I allowed to do that as an F1 student? Uh, or would it have any impact? And uh, and I've got I've got my own opinion about that. Uh, but I, I was going to see Carol what you what you thought about just entering the diversity visa lottery, not necessarily being selected. I don't think there's a problem in entering and just entering a registration. However, if you are selected, then at that point you are you are going to have to be um, careful about traveling because you are eligible to apply for permanent resident at that, at that point, you've demonstrated that immigrant intent and you might not be let back in with your, with your uh, F1 visa. Yeah. Now I, I and, and there are different opinions on this too. And I, I've heard attorneys say different things. It, it's my opinion that your underlying visa status remains intact as long as you maintain that visa status and you don't do anything to violate that visa status. So for us, we typically will recommend, you know, if a student is going through a self petition permanent residency, or if they file for uh, something like diversity visa lottery, get selected and they go through a green card process like that, as long as they aren't doing anything to violate their F1 status, they continue to enroll full time. They only work within the, uh, re the restrictions in the F1 world then everything is fine uh, as far as we're concerned with the caveat that traveling is not recommended and we don't recommend that they try to renew a non-immigrant visa because they will be denied at the visa appointment and they'll be denied at the port of entry uh, and could be considered as committing visa fraud to pretend to not have done these other things that prove immigrant intent. Uh, so we usually will put that out there 
Um, you know, but yeah, just putting your name in the hat for the diversity visa lottery and not getting selected. I don't think that that has any implication. I do. I have heard anecdotally that someone has, at, you know, like been asked during other visa interviews, well, have you ever applied even to just put, put your name in for the diversity visa lottery? And so that would be like an in, individual visa officer that has kind of a different interpretation. But I haven't seen that play out anywhere with anything else that I've I've filed. So um, anyway, it's, it's a good question. Um, and it, it's one that does come up every year uh, because we are nearing the end of that open uh, lottery period too, I think. So um, yeah. And that selection process is weird. Like it, uh, it comes up, uh, the, the deadline, comes up and then it's several months before people are notified and then uh then there's another round of notifications and, and it, it it is a a long um uh, long process there's a couple more questions here in the chat uh what are the stages involved in national interest waiver applications at what point are you restricted from traveling um i'm not sure i understand the question but i'm, I'm going to try to respond with a national interest waiver if you file your national interest waiver petition, then at that point, um, an officer at the port of entry could take the position that you've demonstrated immigrant intent. So it is usually prudent not to travel during the pendency of that. Now that we have premium processing for NIW, it makes it a, you know, a lot easier. As far as when you absolutely cannot travel, if you are in any status other than H-1B or H-4, once you file your application to adjust status, that final stage in your process, you cannot travel until you get an advanced parole document, which is a travel document. If you do travel before you get that, you will be deemed to have abandoned that application and you won't get back in on your temporary visa. And uh, as a follow up to that, and this is uh, you, you talked about forgetting to plan for your family as like keeping them in mind. Somebody asked, as an F1 holder pursuing a PhD, can I file for a national interest waiver while my dependents, spouse and child are not yet in the US? Yeah, and that kind of goes back to have you demonstrated immigrant intent by filing that I-140 petition? And if you have, that means you violated your H stat. I'm sorry, your F status, and so they're not your family members are not going to be able to enter on an F. I would say make sure they get here if they're coming on an F to get them here before. Or you uh, now you can start building the case. You can start putting things together. It's it's all about the filing with USCIS. Um, I, yeah. Uh, it would potentially impact them. I have had this happen before. In fact, we had, and I'm not going to mention specific students, but we've had, we have a student here who obtained permanent residency and after obtaining permanent residency here in the U.S. decided to start the process of bringing his family in. And so sponsoring your family after the fact for permanent residency uh, as a U.S. permanent resident, they're not they're not a derivative applicant now. Now you're sponsoring them as under an I-130 and like they didn't include them in his petition. And so that made it extremely difficult. Uh, and, and I'm sure that that's come up other times too. And backlogs for sponsorship at for a U.S. permanent resident sponsoring a spouse or U.S. permanent resident sponsoring a child uh, they're real. Uh, I, I don't, I don't look at the family-based case, uh, categories, but I know Carol, you do a lot of family-based cases, but, uh, that is definitely a, a longer wait period than, uh, if you're just doing it all at, at one time, right? That's correct. Yeah. Uh, would it cause any trouble to travel to attend conferences for professional purposes while in the process of permanent uh, residency? It depends what your status is. If you're H-1B or H-4, by all means, you can continue to travel during the entirety of the process. If you're in any of those other temporary categories that we were talking about, you do not need to travel until you get, get that travel document. 
I'm actually having that conversation with someone who's a, a new faculty member here at the university. Uh, he uh, has a green card uh, pending independently uh, and is currently on OPT and has is eligible for STEM OPT. And so, you know, the question is like, well, you know, why should I go forward with an H-1B if I've got these three years of work eligibility? And like, I, I know it's it sounds like you don't really need it. However, you may, as a professional, as a faculty member, be asked to travel on behalf of the university or attend conferences, in which case that H-1B is going to be critical for being able to do that because um, H-1B is a dual intent category. Uh, so, oh, someone has asked, uh, does having a U.S. green card mean I'm no more a citizen in my home country? Do I become a dual citizen? Uh, and permanent residency is different than citizenship. Uh, so I, I, that that needs to be clarified. Um, and, and, and Carol can talk about this because once somebody gets permanent residency, uh, you know, our office we serve non-immigrants. And so uh, we still, of course, welcome everybody. We like having the American kids and the uh, U.S. permanent residents and everything. But at the same time, our, our advising kind of stops at the permanent residency. So we can't help with the transition to U.S. citizenship. But uh, a green card is not the same thing as citizenship. Although I've anecdotally heard of some countries that do consider once you become a U.S. permanent resident, that you're no longer a citizen of your home country uh, and they may uh, confiscate your, your travel documents. Those are usually very restrictive countries. And so I, I think you would have to find out what your own country's take is on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Charter. Um, just keep in mind, there are three stages of immigration. There's temporary student, H-1B, TN. There's Permanent residency, where you get a green card, permanent resident means you're allowed to live and work in the United States permanently, okay? Unless you, you know, you could still be deported as a permanent resident, but that's going to mean you've gotten into some really serious criminal trouble um, in, if you are deported as a permanent resident. And then citizenship is a benefit that you may get later. Uh, the general rule is once you've been a permanent resident for at least five years and have maintained your permanent residency and you got good moral character and all that good stuff and you filed and paid your taxes because the government's going to make sure it gets its money, then you can file for citizenship. It's called the naturalization process. Once you are a U.S. citizen, then you have all the rights of any other citizen born in this country other than you can't run for president. And good Lord, who would want to do that? Um, but the difference with a U.S. citizen is you have the right to vote. A permanent resident does not have the right to vote. And a U.S. citizen cannot be deported. Um, so that's the biggest difference, whether or not, you know, you're a, you, whether or not you are a dual citizen, that is based on, like Charter said, the policy of your country. Because the U.S. government, when it issues you that certificate of naturalization, they're not going to take your passport for your home country. But again, there are some countries that basically will revoke your citizenship. And that's, you know, that's based on that country's laws, not the U.S. laws. Yeah. Uh, and one uh, other thing, uh, you know, that I was going to add to all of that, uh, you know, maintaining your citizenship and any requirements uh, with your home country, do take a look at what that is. I mean, we've had to go through that process with our own family, you know, and, uh, and you know, my wife is from a country that does not recognize dual citizenship so that when you are, when you gain citizenship in another country, you have now abandoned your citizenship. They, uh, they at least give you one year to kind of settle your finances <laughs> and literally uh, to like settle any property uh, exchange or anything else. But after that, it's it's done. So every every country is different. Um, now, there was a question. Uh, what is the cost for a national interest waiver? Uh, I know what the filing fees are for an I-140, but, uh, you know, would you... Uh, care to share what it would cost to do a national interest waiver if someone was to engage with your firm? 
Um, generally speaking, those the different types of cases are going to have different fees. For labor certification, it's going to be one thing, national interest waiver another, outstanding professor researcher another. Um, typically, you're looking at if, let's say, for example, you were going to file for pre premium processing and just for the national interest waiver petition, you're probably looking at close to $10,000 uh, in attorneys and filing fees. And then you're going to have to also apply to adjust your status uh, with filing fees and medical exams that are required at that stage. You're probably looking at another $4,000 plus whatever the adjustment of status costs for your family members, probably about the same amount for them uh, for each family member that you have to include. So it gets very, very um, pricey when you start looking at these immigration filings. But if you look at the benefit that you receive at the end of it, then of course it's well worth the money, but it's just, you know, be, expect to, you know, to have to put some savings towards these types of, of processes. And as, and as bad as it sounds, it's still less than one semester of tuition at the University of Alabama. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I that's my little joke at the end, but that's unfortunately very true for our non uh, non resident tuition is is around fifteen thousand dollars per semester. So um, it, it sounds like a bargain. Uh, thank you so much, Carol. I, I don't know if anybody else has any questions. I did put in the chat. I will be sharing the recording after this. Uh, my last joke and all. Uh, so I, I will share that back out with everybody as well as the slides. Um, and so look for that. It does take Zoom a very long time to finish compiling the video and everything. So after we were done with this morning session, it was sometime around two this afternoon that it finished up. So that was about two and uh, a little over two hours later, two and a half hours later. So it may be tomorrow before we share anything out because I don't know that I'm going to be here at eight or nine o'clock tonight when this finally finishes up. But uh, I do thank everybody for uh, taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Uh, Carol, huge thanks to you for taking the time to speak with our students and with our scholars and our departments. This is her third session. So we, we've taken up a lot of her time in the last couple of days, but we, we truly appreciate that. Uh, and if the students on this uh, Zoom recording have any questions, uh, you can always touch base with us. We can't really uh, advise on, you know, self-petition cases or anything like that, but we can talk with you about uh, everything uh, related to maintaining your visa status with us and, and kind of uh, making that ease of transition. So we really do uh, uh, want to make sure that you have the resources you need and can point you back to uh, resources when we can't help you. So. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I hope this has been helpful for everyone. And I wish you all a great afternoon. All right. Thank you, everybody.